Northwest Tennessee, 1908. It's a cool October night in Obion County when violence erupts. Um, for months now, there's been tension brewing between the Knight Riders of Real Foot Lake and the West Tennessee Land Company. Uh, this was because the farmers in the area relied on the resources from Real Foot Lake uh, to feed their families to fish and to hunt. And the West Tennessee Land Company wanted to fill it in and then farm cotton underneath it. As you can imagine, um, this didn't go over so well. For about seven months, it builds and it builds. There's back and forth arson. There is, uh, you know, shots being fired. There's whippings that occur. Uh, and then, you know, October 19th, 1908, um, it leads to murder. Real Foot Lake was created by the New Madrid earthquakes in 1811. Uh, December, there is a, a major earthquake and it really impacts the terrain. And then it's followed by a series of aftershocks. And the Mississippi River is flooding uh, these upheavals caused from this earthquake. And that becomes what we know as Real Foot Lake in present-day Obion County. Northwest Tennessee is inhabited by the Chickasaw. Uh, and unfortunately, in the 1830s, they are forced out of the area. It's a very tragic story. Not long after that, uh, settlers begin to move into northwest Tennessee, and they quickly discover the resource of Real Foot Lake. You know, this is key for their survival. They can hunt it. They can fish it. Uh, they can provide for their families. It really becomes a way of life for them. Around 1870, a man named James Harris, he begins to buy up the land under and around the lake, little by little, until eventually, in 1899, he announces that he owns the lake and that he intends to drain it and farm the land under it. A group of business owners and citizens of Real Foot Lake area, they file a lawsuit and aim it at blocking Harris from doing this. And this lawsuit does eventually reach the Tennessee Supreme Court, and it forces Harris to abandon his plans to drain the lake. You know, the victory is short-lived. James Harris uh, doesn't get what he wants, but he passes away in 1903. And then his son, Judge, uh, takes over his property. And in 1905, uh, he announces his intention to stop anyone from fishing the lake without paying him a fee. Then he forms the business known as the West Tennessee Land Company. Uh, his plan is to operate and make a profit from the lake and its shoreline. Now, to the people who made their living and fed their families by fishing on Real Foot Lake, they felt like they were running out of options. Tom Johnson was one of those men, and he said it later like this, quote, God saw that we couldn't make a living farming, so he ordered an earthquake, and the earthquake left a big hole. Next, he filled the hole with water and put fish in it. Then he knew we couldn't make a living between farming and fishing. But along comes these rich men who don't have to make no living, and they tell us that we must not fish the lake anymore, because they own the lake and the fish God put there for us. It just naturally ain't right. Strange. It ain't no justice. End quote. Around the time that this is going on, there's also a nationally publicized wave of violence happening in southern Kentucky. It's between the small-time tobacco farmers and these big-time American tobacco companies. Um, and as a result of this, the small-time rebel farmers would attack these big properties at night from horseback, and they wore black hoods while doing this. So they were given the name the Night Riders. Now, back in northwest Tennessee, the fishermen and farmers of Real Foot Lake became inspired by this. Uh, so them, along with their friends, uh, they began making these night raids against the West Tennessee Land Company and its allies. I need to be objective and clear here because as I research this, uh, it seems like their cause may have started out noble. But somewhere along the way, I think they definitely got some of their lines crossed and at times may have even attacked someone who didn't have anything to do with the West Tennessee Land Company. This brings us to the night of the murder, October 19th, 1908, uh, when West Tennessee Land Company, Quentin Rankin, and R.Z. Taylor were dragged from a hotel in a community known as Walnut Law. Quentin Rankin was a 39-year-old attorney for the West Tennessee Land Company, and uh, they drag him out to the woods in the middle of a swamp. The other man they drug out there that night was Colonel Robert Taylor, or R.Z. Taylor. He was a, a veteran of the Civil War. He fought for the Confederate. And 
He's quite a bit older than Rankin, so perhaps that's why they start with a younger attorney. The members of the mob were all wearing hoods, they were all armed, and one of them ties a rope around a Quentin's neck. They tie the other end around a strong tree branch, and then they lift him into the air for a few seconds, and then eventually lower him back to the ground, and they ask him a question. And that question was, are you going to compromise? They asked Rankin, and he adamantly refused. So they lift him in the air again, then they lower him, and they ask him again. He said no. And then he says, gentlemen, don't do that. You're killing me. And he gasped. And one of the hooded men fires shotgun into the chest of Quentin Rankin. This noise echoes all across the woods and the swamps. It shocks most of the men who were present at the time. Many of the men testified that they had not intended to commit murder that night. But murder was committed. And now Quentin Rankin was dead. I want you to take a moment and think about the other attorney, Colonel Robert Taylor, and what he must have been thinking. Probably the same thing you or I would be thinking. You see, after his friend Quentin Rankin is shot and killed, he decides to make a break for it. Under the cover of darkness, during the commotion, he runs for his life. And when they hear him fleeing, they immediately turn in his general direction and they open fire in what must have been a hailstorm of bullets. But they miss. By now, the question of their intentions was overruled by the fact that there was a witness and he could not be allowed to see another day. However, the colonel would live to see another day. Uh, He dove into the swamp and he finds a partially sunken cypress tree and he holds up behind it under the cover of darkness uh, for about an hour until the night riders presume he's dead and uh, they leave the area. Colonel Taylor still has quite an ordeal ahead of him. Uh, He waits it out for a bit and then eventually starts making his way northwest through the swamps and the bayous, walking through the woods. Uh, and he's eventually found on October 21st. He reaches a friendly farmer who feeds him, gives him medical aid, and then alerts the authorities. By the time it was all said and done, he had been missing for about 30 hours and traveled more than 25 miles. The story of his survival was actually publicized in a newspaper across the country. Now, with the murder of Quentin Rankin, Tennessee Governor Malcolm Patterson is forced to call upon the Tennessee National Guard um, to help restore order to the real Foot Lake area. Between working with law enforcement officials and all the volunteers, they end up rounding up somewhere around 50 suspects. However, there was a growing concern that an Obion County jury would never have the courage to convict the accused murderers in the Knight Rider case. But by this time, many residents of Obion County were actually more disgusted by the methods of the Knight Riders than they were afraid of. So in January 1909, a jury found eight Knight Riders guilty and sentenced six of them to death. The verdict and the sentence were, at the time, held as a triumph of law and order. However, the Tennessee Supreme Court later overturned these convictions because of the manner in which the judge had actually chosen the jury. The men were never tried again, and there was no evidence that the Knight Riders ever committed another crime in the Real Foot Lake area. And in 1914, the state of Tennessee bought Real Foot Lake and much of the shoreline. Then a law was passed declaring the lake public domain. What that means is people can fish there regardless of who owns the shoreline. Today, the lake and much of the shoreline are public property. People can fish, hunt, and sightsee around the lake. You can enjoy the wildlife refuge and the state park. Today, it may look a lot different, and it is a far cry from its humble beginnings and also the legend of the Knight Riders of Real Foot Lake. Thank you for listening to this episode on the Knight Riders at Real Foot Lake. I'm Joe Watts with Shooting the Breeze with Joe, and I hope you have enjoyed this episode. I would like to make a couple of honorable mentions for this episode. First of all, Knight Riders at Real Foot Lake. It is a book by Paul Vanderwood and is the definitive book on this subject. It was researched in the 1950s. Wood interviewed about 25 people from Obion and Lake Counties who lived through that era including several people who had once been night riders. I would like to also reference my personal research for this story came from the Tennessee Magazine in an article by Bill Carey titled Real Foot Lake and its Dark History of Night Riders. I hope you enjoyed this story and I thank you all for listening. So put another log on that fire.